no reason you should ever inspect a property without looking at it on a Google image first. So if you don't know how to do a Google image uh, satellite search, just go on to Google and figure it out. There's actually timeline search that you can figure it out. And my house is the one that has the nicest lawn if you take a look in the picture. Um, this is a great search, not to learn if there's damage, it tells you how big the house is, what parking is like, what you're gonna be looking at, what kind of roofing you have to deal with. Uh, so this makes your job a lot easier. I tell people to print this out, bring it with them, and then or save it in your digital file if you're using a computer. And when you get to the house, you say, yeah, I took a look at the house before I got here. I may have con some, some concerns with the roof. As adjusters, we actually state right off the bat that we grab the, the satellite measurements off of our services for the roof measurements if we're making a roof claim. You should know what's going on before you get to the property. See this, learn this, understand what's going on. Even though it's not today's image, it tells you what you're about to walk into. Very important to do before you go to a property, you have some understanding of what's going on. Your first image should always capture the address. This got cropped a little in the slide, but it was in the image. Your first image of your photo uh, believe it or not, it should be further back that contains the whole house. My exterior video shows it all the way from the curb, grabbing the mailbox. But if your first image doesn't have the address in it, you'll always get confused when you look back through your photos. And if you realize now your photos save your GPS coordinates, you can usually search the street address in your photos and all your photos for that lost come up. Uh, so please make sure that your images, and again, in your camera or your phone, start and stop with those uh, addresses included in the pictures. When you're taking pictures on the exterior of a property, you wanna make sure, and again, I do a full video on the exterior instructions. You wanna make sure that that initial image captures the whole house. If you get the address in it, that's fantastic. I actually teach, always go to the right. You can never be wrong if you go to the right. Take the front, take the right, take the back, take the left. You wanna try and get roofing and siding in all of your images. And again, we teach it a little further in the video, soft metal inspections, trying to get up close, but we cannot tell if there's roof damage from that image, but you might be able to get closer images as you walk around. You might be able to get closer soft metal images, which are indications of hail. But if I only have one image of the exterior of the property, the odds are we won't be able to fully evaluate the claim. You do need all four elevations, depending on, there could be more than that, but you need at least four perimeter pictures of the property. So this is a picture of corporate office in one of the training rooms. And if you take a look at how the images are taken, it's called corner to corner. So if you took this room, for example, I'm taking my first image from right there going that way. And I'm taking my next image from all the way back there in the cheap seats coming this way. I'm getting most of the office in each picture. So if you look where I'm standing in that back left corner, I see the ceiling, I see all three walls, most of the ceiling, most of the floor. Look at the other image going the other direction. I can combine those two images. Oh, thank you very much. I can combine those two images and see everything that's going on in that property with two pictures. So I got my floors, my walls, my ceiling with two images. Don't think you want left, right, left, you know, that, that's where you're gonna get very limited. They're much harder to splice together. Take your images from corners way back. You'd be surprised how much better those are. Look, it looks like I have a wide angle camera. That's my cell phone. You see me taking it right there in the image. I, it, yeah, I'm surprised at that as well. So interior property inspection. So if you can sketch an interior and lay out a floor plan, it's a huge help for all of us. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to, it just means you're going to be a better claim rep. I can live without it. I do much better with it. Let me know what you wanna do. Tell me if fastball is coming, I'll rip it over the fence. Tell me I don't know what's coming, I may miss the pitch. So you helping us as an adjuster is helping you. So in the process, doing an interior sketch, even if it's crude, you know, the bedroom's here, you have, everyone should have a laser by now. You got a free laser last year, you got free moisture meters last year. Uh, they're reasonable as well. You register for the convention today, you're getting a free laser anyway. Uh, and if you register, give me an email. I'll look up your registration if you did it today and I'll send it out to you ahead of time. We'll get you out there. So a full sketch is best if you can. Here's what we use as adjusters. 
So as adjusters, we're using lasers to measure everything. We use moisture meters on all water losses and expected or anticipated water losses. We use serious flashlights. When we say a thousand lumen, I've seen so many advertisements for little dinky flashlights that say a thousand lumen. I'm like, only if you hold it up to your eyeball. So you need a good flashlight, a nice big flashlight. We actually, I found some medium sized flashlights that do produce a decent amount of light. You need a lot of light at a thousand lumens, not just a super bright light. So it's gotta be bright and wide and big. Without a flashlight, you will miss half of what you're looking for. It is night and day when you turn it on. I'm watching Joe shake his head. Uh, the first time that I inspected a loss with a flashlight versus without, I could not believe what the difference in the visual inspection was. You can identify flooring coupling, flooring buckling. You can identify water stains that are not visible. You can identify ceiling tiles like no one's business because there's a small texture and the light shadows those. Very, very important to use a uh, flashlight. You do not have to buy a thermal camera. They're relatively expensive. We all have thermal cameras. Offer a thermal image to people. My adjuster, when he comes out, he's going to take a look or she's going to take a look. They're going to take a thermal image if you'd like. Let me know. I'll give them a note that they want to have a thermal image taken to see if there's any water trap behind that wall, behind that floor, behind that door, under that roof, in that ceiling. We use calipers. We actually use digital calipers to measure in thousands of an inch to show decompression of building materials. So let's say I take a photograph of swollen or, or decompressed laminate floor. What is the, what is the common uh, response from the insurance company? I don't see the damage. They don't. I don't really see it either. So I put a pair of digital calipers on it and I put it on a, a non-decompressed section and I can show three thousandths of an inch of decompression slash swell. The, the camera, shows the digital readout of the calipers that the material is larger on the end than the middle. It's done. It's demonstrable. The word in the policy is damage must be demonstrable. Once it's demonstrable, once it's demonstrable, it's a covered loss. If it's not demonstrable, meaning we can't see it, we can't cover it. So by using digital data to document the damage, we have covered losses. And of course, digital cameras. They've gotten substantially good. The new iPhone 12 and up have LiDAR. We're actually shifting the LiDAR to do our measurements. Uh, they're that good now. The new iPad and the new iPhones are able to measure within an eighth of an inch while capturing the image. Uh, so we are moving to full LiDAR measurements. Relatively expensive still, but we are moving there. You know, using a laser, and I tell everybody the equivalent laser that we use is a Bosch GLM-50. I like it because it's cheap. It's $69. Uh, it's in color. The display is easy. Uh, and it's just a very accurate tool. For a homeowner, it's the coolest thing in the world. You can either occupy the cat while you're measuring by flipping a little. I usually have a cat jumping on and off the sofa and the homeowner doesn't know I'm doing it. And they're like, why is the cat going crazy? And I just keep doing this. But what the homeowner really likes is you telling them how big their rooms are. The homeowner loves being engaged in the measurement process. Oh, just so you know, this room's 18 by 13, six. Oh, that ceiling 16 foot four. Oh, I always thought it was 20 feet. Uh, I, I never knew how big my family room was. Oh, why we're here, we'll measure it. You, you'll walk through, you'll give them their dimensions and they're loving it. It's like, wow, well, I never knew that. Do you mind if I write it down? Great part of your inspection process. Uh, make sure your laser is set to measure from the back. If you look at the laser uh, right on the, um, Bottom, uh, that screen's actually not really good. It should be set on feet and inches and to be measuring from the back of the laser. There's a little diagram showing that it's measuring from the back and set it to feet and inches, not fractions like that. So our moisture meters are non-invasive. Now the moisture meter we uh, provide for you or give to you or you're able to acquire by any metro standard have both invasive and non-invasive. Invasive. Invasive is metal prongs that go in building materials with two holes. I don't need you sticking holes in people's walls. So use the non-invasive part, which is the back, which is just inductive, much like any other thing. Just hold it up against it. It measures the moisture that way. Do not open up the two metal prongs and stick them in. The metal prongs can be used for carpet padding, but that's it. Please just don't use them. It works even without the prongs. Um, so that is what we do for moisture. Now, with moisture, this is again, digital documentation of the value of a loss and the extent of a loss. Lori is hooked on it. She started using it a year and a half ago. 
every single loss Lori signs, she'll be like, oh, I measure the floor. It goes all the way over to here. I was in the bedroom. It's back here. The bathroom is coming through the grout. This is awesome for underground pipes because you can actually show where the floor is saturated. No waters actually came out yet. So typical picture of a thousand lumen flashlight. Costco actually has a 2,400 lumen flashlight right now for $25. Uh, the problem is it takes like 172 AAA batteries. I think it's actually nine, maybe 12. But every time I go to put it in, I'm like, I have to put it on financing for 36 months and the batteries only last a few months and it's like you start over again. But anyway, a solid size flashlight, LED with a lot of lumens is what we're looking for. Um, this is the flashlight we had given out at conventions years past. Don't try and grab a little dinky flashlight. If it has substantial light and you can see 30 feet away and it lights up the room, that's great. But you wanna make sure your flashlight has enough quality and quantity of light that actually really helps you see the loss. Not so digital as a notepad. It's basic. There are digital notepads out there that are really cool. You fill your notes out, they show up in your computer by the time you get home. And ironically, I have actually moved to only using notes on my iPhone now. Uh, so the notes section in my iPhone, I open it up on every single loss uh, and it allows you to insert photos as you go. So you can take photos, put them in. So I put my dimensions, I go to insert sketch, I actually sketch the room with my finger. I then put the dimensions in. I take a picture of the room and all my scope notes now are buried into my iPhone and I never lose them. It makes life so much easier. But a notepad is fast, it's, it's efficient, it's good to have with you and it always works and it never needs to be recharged. So does anyone here not do test, by, test swipes with sponges? Who does not? Who's never used a smoke sponge? Come on, volunteer. You all get a free one if you've never... Devin, I'll smack the living out of you. I'll smack the smoke right off you. Stop it. Devin always raises his hand for free stuff. Please he? check in now. All right. So hang on one second. So smoke inspections, the average smoke claim is about $9,000. I just did a loss referred by Scott Gallant, one of our attorneys. It's his uh, home decorator, and they had a stucco claim. I'm looking at the policy saying there's no stucco claim here because this policy is not going to cover anything. I go to the house. I can't find anything. It's a beautiful home, highly decorated, insured for a million dollars. I walk through and I go to the family room. And it's highly decorated. She's a decorator. And I see a little smoke shadowing all around the pictures. And I said, what happened here? We pulled the pictures down and we noticed the shadowing. Okay. I said, that's great. I said, yeah, so I get through the entire property inspection basement. I even went in the attic. Scott's friend, can you help him out? They just had a big stucco claim, cost them 40 grand to fix your siding, and they're still upset. Okay, so I said, I get done. I said, listen, you have relatively small smoke claim. I think I can help you with that. They said, anything you could do would help. Any amount of money you could get us would help. The stucco really set us back. We weren't expecting it. Can you help? I said, I can do a smoke claim. It just settled for $88,000. If I showed you the images, you would laugh. Now, everything went right. It was basically lady luck pulling a slot machine. They gave me the right vendors. They gave me all the right adjusters. I knew everybody. One was a former adjuster at Metro. Um, long story short, $88,000. That's not an average smoke claim, but it is 10, 15, 20,000. If you're not signing smoke claims, if you're not using smoke sponges, you're missing the claims. And I do specifically explain and show how to take images and identify uh, gas fireplaces and furnaces in the inspection videos. Yes. So the first indicator is they have a gas fireplace. If they have one, they have a smoke claim. They come together. I don't think I've ever walked in a house without a gas fireplace without a smoke claim. Uh, it is just that easy to do. Uh, gas furnace, gas fireplace, oil furnace, oil fireplace, I mean, I'm sorry, oil furnace, uh, temporary heat if they use kerosene heaters. Kitchens are not as common. Uh, generally houses with oil furnaces or oil heat of some sort are the easiest, but gas fireplaces, if they have one, that's their claim. A regular fireplace, if they burn door flame logs, great question during a property inspection, will often also have smoke damage in the house. The great part about the door flame log 
is the soot on the walls is paraffin based because the door flame log is a big candle and they can't discern the image, can't discern the smoke from that of candles. So as long as they have a fireplace, the candle, if there is candle soot, it's kind of commingled. Therefore, it's still a covered loss and they can't tell the two apart. All right. So look at that one. If you miss that, you're just blind. That's okay. But the ruler allows you to take an image to show it on the phone. Wayne, Wayne Brown actually has a metal ruler and a magnet, so it stands up on edge, holds his flashlight behind it. The light goes underneath the flashlight. He takes an image. You do need a straight edge in your toolbox. You do need a straight edge in your bag. You do need a way to hold the straight edge up. And again, Wayne uses a metal ruler. He's got all kinds of tools. He's figured everything out. I think he was the most... Um, now, I'm going to say abused child, and he never had anything. And he figured his way out of his bedroom after cutting through three locks. And then he got outside and he found food from friends and he, and he evolved and he became an adjuster. And he's like, I can do this because everything else in life was much harder. Um, but Wayne has figured out ways to do things to show images and take pictures and flashcards and you name it. And he's always like, Bill, I don't have that problem. Here's how I solved it. And I'm like, he still has duct tape residue from when he was 13 on his wrist, but it will come off. So a ruler or a straight edge, great way to take a picture. And that's a, a highly demonstrable image, correct? The image we're looking for is the one you can barely tell, where you can just see a little bump or just see a little hollow or just see a little light under the ruler. But putting a flashlight behind that straight edge and shining it, you would have seen all that light coming through. So even if it was incredibly small, you'd be able to see that damage with a straight edge and a ruler. Please update and upgrade and stay up to date with your smartphone. The technology is becoming so good. The images are so good. Just five years ago, adjusters were not allowed to use smartphones for their images. Today, it's the preferred method to take an image because the cameras are that good. But the cameras, it's not the cameras that are that good, it's the focusing sensors, and it's now all the data that comes with the image. So use your smartphone, get a good smartphone, stay up to date on that. I don't care what brand you use. I just can't imagine not using an Apple. I'm just saying, <laughs> anyone else? Look in the mirror and say what's going on, but I can tell you right now, you're wrong. All right. Use a good smartphone, take good images, and you'd be surprised how much easier our job is as adjusters. When we zoom in on a high-end image, we see damage. When we zoom in on a crappy photo, we see crappy, you know, it just becomes cloudy and pixelated. So now when you do an upper level of a home, we're really looking on that top section. So right there in the ceiling of that home, there's a stain, and that's actually, I can tell by the image, that's drywall, not plaster, just by the way it's stained. But I look at that image, and I see potentially plaster, dry, plaster molding as well, or some form of detailed drywall molding, which is that kind of crown molding look there. That image, I'm going to really be looking for the floor after that. But that image has a lot of continuous paint. It's got a drywall repair. It's got detach and reset trim. It's clearly next to another room. You can see more water on the wall beneath it. There's a lot going on with that image. And honestly, that's hard to see without a flashlight. I know it seems easy right now. You walk in that house in a sunny day, that image is almost a walk by sometimes. So you do need to inspect your exterior. and You do need to look around those window treatments. A lot of people skip this because you walk in the room and don't see damage. And then you'll... I've had a homeowner say, no, it's over here. They hold the curtain back and you look up and the, the whole drywall is crumbling at the top of the window. You'll miss that if you don't do the work. So you can't just phone it in and say, I don't see anything. The winds are always the winning of a claim or the winning of an inspection is going a little further. I still tell the story of Lori Fantini uh, wrote up a claim and I called her like, you're an idiot. I don't see what you're talking about. And Lori says, did you move the sofa? Move the sofa? Who do I look like? I said, you moved the sofa? So I moved the sofa, and I see rust on the carpet from the leg of the sofa. And then Lori's like, no, you big idiot or dummy. And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, look under the window. I moved the sofa. I crawl under the window, and I'm like, I found it. 
No, no, I didn't find it. Lori found it and explained to me, the idiot, how to find it. So after Lori showed it to me, the loss was $6,000. Before that, I walked in, I said, Lori, I don't see anything, you're blind. And again, you got to do the work. So the image that was years ago, before we had great cameras and great images, there was a phone call every time. Now you can upload that image. Now you can make that description. It can show that, and it'll probably show in the camera. Back then, we didn't even really have that. I think it was, and when the picture came out, right, for a dollar. All right, we talk about this all the time. I'm going to tell you right now, flooring is the key to making money. Flooring is the key to making money. As a group, are you ready? Flooring is the key to making money. You know, to, give me one more time. Flooring is the key to making money. Floor. <laughs> I love floors. Flooring is everything. When I walk in a property, I'm only looking at floors because drywall and paint is so easy. It just floors are where the big jackpots are. I'll find all the other stuff. Let me find the floor. So when you're doing flooring, laminate flooring is the gift that keeps on giving. It's all damaged. It's very easy. It's damaged by a sponge. It's damaged by a, a spill, an ice cube. You need to inspect flooring very, very closely. That's a completely total floor. It needs to be completely replaced. It's not repairable. Uh, you know, six, eight thousand dollars on top of whatever's on the ceiling. Flooring is the secret to getting it all done. Looking outside and near or around water producing devices. So this is the hallway outside of a bathroom. That's a lot of times where your damage is, even though the water producing device is on the other side of that wall. So making it right through that tan wall, gold wall, is where the toilet is. The floor could be buckled right here. You're not thinking to look there because there's no, to the toilet's a foot away. It's just on the other side of a wall. Water does not care. Water goes right under that wall, damages that floor all day long. Main level first floor, big open floor plans. I walk in there, what do I say? Or what do I see? Tell me what it is. The floor is where the money is, right? There's a huge sliding door. There's huge windows. There's a refrigerator. There's a sink and a dishwasher. I will know them on a first name basis before I leave. I have a Tinder account. I send them a friend request. I swipe right at every window, door, dishwasher, and refrigerator. You're my friend. I love you. All the damage will be there if it's going to be in those kitchens. And it is there. It is there. I just inspected a $2 million house the other day. Homeowner says to me, I have no damage in my house. I said, that's okay. Do you mind if I call you a liar? And he said, what do you mean? I said, because if I find it, will you agree that you're wrong? I could show you the picture. He's like, I can't believe that. I lifted up a doormat. I can't believe that's leaking. I can't believe it. Thank you for finding it. It's unbelievable. Go to the door, look at the hardwood floor. Go to the refrigerator, look at the hardwood floor. Go to the sink, look at the hardwood floor. Go to the dishwasher, oh, underneath the windows. But that hardwood floor is potentially damaged and you need to identify it. You're not gonna do it with an over. You can't see any damage in that picture. It's there. Most of that, well, that is definitely pre-finished. So when you identify flooring damage or any room, you need to let us know as adjusters if the room continues to another room. If the floor is damaged in this room here, we're getting paid for the hallway because the boards run through this way. If the boards are parallel to the door, they won't continue the floor. Even though it's the same floor, they'll break it. If they go this way, we'll get both rooms or even where that continues on the other side. So upstairs, your damages are going to be usually from your bathroom, usually going to be ceilings in a bedroom or outside walls in a bedroom, which would be smoke, or they're going to be in the hallway because the hallway leads to two floors. Where's the most common room? So if the bathroom is the common water producing device, what room will have the obvious damage other than the bathroom if the loss came from the bathroom and we're still staying up? Okay, underneath, upstairs, stay upstairs. Where is it? It is the hallway outside the bathroom. Everybody skips it. The little hallway right outside the bathroom, the water hits the tile floor, it runs out there, and everybody jumps on the towels and dries it up but it damages the floor. We'll pull that carpet back. We'll see the damage underneath. We'll look at that photograph with the hardwood floor. We'll see damage to the floor. 
Where else? I walk into a bathroom, I got a shower, I got a toilet. Where else? It's the bedrooms on the other sides of the wall of the toilet and the tub. So go find out what's behind the toilet. It's usually a closet. I've had 800 pair of shoes in a closet. I rip them all out and I walk in, I pull up the carpet and it's soaked. The toilet overflowed, it damaged the carpet, hit the hardwood floor. Same thing with the tub on the other side. Do not think a bathroom is centrally located as a room. It's a focal point and the rooms that are connected on either side, the water runs right under the walls. You fail to inspect it more often than not. The easiest one is the hallway right outside. But if you're not looking at the rooms that are right behind the water producing devices, you're missing half of the work. Main level, foyer entryway, big window, kitchen, serious. We, we know all the appliances, family room, living room, dining room, powder room, bath, and laundry are generally on your main level. Inspection video is gonna really explore these for you, making your life a little bit easier. When you're in the basement, please identify if they have a sump pump. If they do, I need pictures at the pump and around the pump. Around the pump will generally tell me if it overflowed or discharged. The furnace, get a picture of the service tag. The furnace overview, it'll tell me what fuel it is. The type of furnace, hot air, hot water. I learned so much from furnace pictures. I know what my fuel is. I know what my delivery method is. I know what my potential losses are. I know what my service dates are. And I can tell you right now, on a hot air, gas, or oil furnace, if you read the service tag, there's actually losses listed with dates of loss. There are. It'll actually say, burner not running properly, changed fuel, replaced filter, running now, smoke uh, has been reduced to an acceptable level. My data loss is right on there with a tag. Take a picture. And it was like two months ago. It's unbelievable. Uh, furnace tag's important. Uh, ceiling tiles in the basement. I actually forgot to go over the ceiling tiles while doing my basement. I, I don't have any ceiling tile damage as far as I know. But in a basement, ceiling tiles are under the kitchen, they're under the bathroom, they're under the laundry room. It's pretty easy to have ceiling tiles damaged in a basement. Please do not forget to inspect them. Water equipment. So if they have pumps, wells, softeners, whatever water equipment's in a basement, if there's a bathroom, treat it like any other level, but water producing equipment in a basement has a, a greater chance of leaking than on the main level. Why? It doesn't get used as much. People forget about it. The dehumidifier in a basement clogs up, overfills. The condensate pump gets clogged from sitting all winter. You turn the air conditioning on. Uh, the toilet doesn't get flushed all the time. So all of these devices have a greater chance of failure in the basement just due to most people don't live in their basements as often as the main floor. So an unfinished basement is still a good claim identifier. Furnace for sure, sump pump possibly. So if I got a $10,000 sump pump limit, we were talking about one yesterday, unfinished basement, we got 66,000 bucks for uh, with unlimited sump pump coverage, but it was a sump pump law, it still covers personal property. Furnace is still gonna tell me if I have a smoke claim. Water producing equipment may produce contents, may produce something to that effect, but you still inspect an unfinished basement. Uh, exterior entrance to the basement, Bilco door, focus around there as well. Uh, potential injury beneath windows, patios and exterior doors, proximity to powder rooms and bathrooms, and in front and around all kitchen appliances. Trust me, the refrigerator is actually more common loss than the dishwasher. The refrigerator fails more often than the dishwasher leaks. The refrigerator has an ice maker, it has ice melts, it has power failures, and it has children that think that that little ice chip tray goes down to the drain. It doesn't, it goes on the floor. <clears throat> Smoke and soot, if you see that, that's a gas fireplace. If you identify a fireplace, you need to focus and say this house potentially has smoke loss. You should tell everybody, warning Will Robinson, if you have a gas fireplace, you need to do this. You need to inspect the outside cold walls of the house, Look for the upper corners, look for shadowing. Do you see any signs of soot, dark stains, visible studs, visible nail pops? Do you see that? Because potentially you're having a, a, a gas 
or a soot leak issue. It could be dangerous to their health. We need to look at it. It should be a warning. That's a kind of a drawn in image, I'm guessing, but around vents will let you know if soot has been circulating through the house. So if you do see vents that have a uh, discharge color, it's a good indication that it's been circulating through the house. Here's an image. That house has real soot damage. There's a smoke sponge. Look at how much it takes off of that ceiling. That's what it normally looks like with heavy smoke loss. The smoke sponge will look like that after a very minor wipe. And if you flick that smoke sponge to try and get the dust or soot off it, if it doesn't come off, it's smoke. If it does, it's dust. That's smoke. It's soot. Um, that is not dirt. You don't do a conspicuous, you don't do that in the middle of the room. The client's not gonna be real happy, right? That's to demonstrate it, that's not during your inspection. Uh, smoke push is here. So failed outlets or fires in neighboring connecting properties will often come through outlets. So this actually is a row home that did not have damage, but there was a fire next door. The smoke got into the basement and came up through and came out the outlets, which is known as push. Uh, it actually paid pretty good. There's about a $25,000 claim. So here's the uh, warning about don't do the smoke swipe in, in front of everybody. We're running a little bit late. Picture of some of the digital imaging we use. Uh, so we're using all of the, uh, you know, the flashlights, the moisture meters, the flares, uh, the, the, the smoke sponges, all that stuff is all what we use all day. Take your service tag picture for sure. Moisture meter is how we map the damage now. So we go around flooring and walling, walls. If you identify a water stain, and you don't use a moisture meter, you're crazy. The moisture meter defines the date of loss or can define the date of loss because if it's still currently wet, I can use the last rainstorm. The moisture meter validates a loss. Homeowner says, I don't know when or if that happened. If the moisture meter is pinging 85%, we know it's new and real. Might be one of the best devices you can keep in your hand. It proves to Please the check in now. you're really inspecting, you're not visually looking. Anyone can look at a water stain, not everybody can actually show the damage on a digital meter. Service tag picture, that's the best. Make sure you get that. It looks something like that. You'll be able to take those images. That is a condensate pump. So that is next to a furnace in a basement. Make sure you identify that, find that, and then take images around it. That thing leaks almost every other year. We do a lot of condensate pump losses. The sump pump might look like that. Take a look at the walls around it. If they're drywall, carpet, flooring, but if it's going to overflow, it's coming out of that pit. And then anything in that proximity, consider that a potential loss. We're not a left to stain on the cinder block, but it may leave a stain 15 feet from there. So look at your building damages near and around the sump pump. There's a ceiling tile stain. Pretty hard to see, isn't it? A little round spot on the ceiling tile there. So it's sometimes you'll walk right by those. Make sure you're using your flashlight to look for that. That would be near a sump pump. So the back of the basement wall in the sump pump actually has a stain like that. And there was no real visible damage on the other side. No damage to the paint, no visible damage, but I found that, guess what? They still need to repair the drywall, which then buys my paint. In this case, we actually got the carpet as well because when we pulled it back, we found damage to the carpet just inside the wall. No visible damage in the basement. Behind the wall, across from the sump pump, we see this. This identifies the loss. Now, if your claim rep is doing the inspection the way we defined it in the new process, this image will come up because they went to the sump pump, they took pictures around, they identified the base of drywall. It's told to take a picture of the walls near the sump pump in the inspection. Please do it. <clears throat> That's replacement of a kitchen cabinet for $14,000. All the cabinets got bought in that case. That's enough water damage to the base of the cabinet to buy at least the base cabinets. And in this case, they had uh, full height cabinets, which then allowed them to get paid for the uppers and the lowers. 14 grand. How many times do you think you've walked by that one? How many times you don't think you pulled the fridge out? You don't have to pull the fridge, but how many times you think that that looked too minor? Everyone looks inside the cabinet, outside the cabinets where the real money is. That's a plenty to get the cabinets replaced. At least the base. That's a wall cabinet. Water came down the side of a window, ran down the side edge of the wall cabinet. That's enough to get the upper cabinets replaced. 
Doesn't look like a lot of damage. A lot of people have this. A lot of people are un are unknowing that that's a covered loss. A lot of people don't feel that that's enough to feel bad about it, but that cabinet will start to disintegrate and potentially collapse because the joint on that lower left corner will become weak. If that's the one that holds all of the serving dishes, uh, it actually could fail relatively soon. Window air conditioner, do you see the water stain? It's pretty minor coming down right under my image there, right above my image. So there's the water stain coming in from a window air conditioner. Uh, again, that could be drywall, insulation, depending on the flooring below it. That is a mini split. Uh, exterior claims, taking a look real quick. That's hard to spot from the ground. So a Hague inspection identifies the hail bruises, but if you had great images of the roof, we could pick that out. So that's a hail claim, very hard, very hard to spot that from the ground. Relatively close up image, but they are hail bruises. That is typical hail from on vinyl siding, by the way. It generally breaks the outside corners. So when you see things like that, that's generally hailstones that did cause that. Uh, that's how vinyl siding gets broken by hail generally. Aluminum siding by hail, there's a bunch of little dings in that siding. Do you see them? They're all over that. There's probably half a dozen, maybe 10 dings. That's a full replacement of siding. That's a full wrap, by the way. Textured aluminum gets a full wrap, meaning all of it. So the soft metal here really shows the hail more than the roof. The soft metal is the valley. When you spot all those dings in the valley, it's a good indication that there's a hail event at that property that requires a full roofing inspection, a full hag inspection. That's what our adjusters do. I would use your hail report to validate the date and see when the last time hail was. That got destroyed. That's the top of a skylight and a cedar roof, $100,000 claim. 100,000 right there. That's a full cedar roof, all the skylights, all the metals, all the flashing. $100,000, guys. Hague inspection is going to spot more hell bruises. A little easier to tell, but that's what we do. We're up there looking. But again, from the ground, most people walk right by that. We use sidewalk chalk, very, very high-tech device. We uh, swipe it across the soft metal. That's a $25 a foot linear uh, foot price for gutter guard. And you can see the hail on that. That's going to move us to a roof inspection. And there is hail damage on that roof. I can spot two or three hits uh, on the shingle right above it. That's going to be a $30,000 claim. Again, you're walking by some of these for the most part, and they're there with proper inspection. That's actually the downspouts. If you see where we put the sidewalk chalk, see the dents in the downspouts? That's what we call an indicator. Most insurance companies will argue back and forth with you all day long whether a bruise on a roof is hail, mechanical, or something else. They never argue once you identify it on soft metal, it then validates the roofing damage. So once we find the dings on the gutters, the downspouts in the soft metal, they then agree that most of the damage that we've identified or indicated on the roofing is most likely hail as well because you can't have that type of damage on soft metal without that. Oh, there's a hail beat up. So that's uh, actually, I think that's Scotty Wolford's commercial claim from years ago uh, that you can see how many dings are in the top of that metal roof. That was $100,000 plus commercial roof claim. So we do offer thermal imaging. Make sure you let your clients know that that's part of our process. That's our digital process. And we actually provide the digital data from the thermal image to the insurance company. Images look something like that. Uh, the blue and the purple areas are the cold or trapped moisture areas. Generally, it's an interpretation, but generally your blue are gonna be your trapped moisture areas. That's what it looks like when you take the entire image. Uh, so that would be a floor. And that would basically be showing where the water in the floor is trapped. Coming out, you can see it's drying and it's actually getting warmer where it's red. But that's actually a digital moisture map through a FLIR. We then show a moisture map through digital mapping like this with software, where we can actually show where the water is in the blue section and it's ending as it gets towards the green section. We lay this over our sketch and that proves the scope. When we use this data, they almost never argue the scope. When we use this data and show it with digital tools, they don't get into a, well, what do you think? They believe it, it's true, it's factual, it gets rid of the subjective nature of an insurance claim. It becomes a digital binary decision. 
that we've provided the data. They need to now provide the coverage. It's a cleaner way to adjust. We're moving this way. All of our presentations are going to contain what we call digital data backup. Here's what we use for the calipers, the device I talked about to show decompression or size of building materials. We actually hold these devices on with digital readouts to show the, the actual size of the material pre and post water. So we show it in water affected areas and unwater affected areas to show that the material still contains water to the point where it decompressed and changed the size. Here's what we deal, we talk about with a floor plan. That's a pretty nice floor plan. There's tons of free software online. There's Google floor plan. There's tons of Google sketch. If you can kind of do this when you lay out a house, it's going to really be helpful for the adjuster to show where you saw things. You can make notes on there and say, here's where the water was. Here's where the toilet was. <clears throat> so what are we looking at right there? What are all those little round dots? Why are they covered in soot? For magnetic and temperature attraction. So smoke will go to its magnetic opposite. It will also go to a temperature. Nails are colder than the surface itself. So they attach the soot. That's a huge smoke claim, by the way. Huge. What are you seeing? Smoke web. Smoke web is not a cobweb covered in soot. It's actually cotton candy from smoke vapor. So it's actually uh, generally synthetic plastic recongealed into a web. What are we looking at? Hard to see though, isn't it? So do you also see above the picture, do you see the buckled seam in the drywall? So you got the vertical water damage coming down, you got the buckled seam, that's gonna be drywall and insulation as well. What are we seeing? It's a lot of water damage underneath of a water, underneath of a window, a lot going on there. So I got a window, I'm probably gonna end up getting baseboard, insulation, because it's exterior, drywall paint, most likely the floor. What am I looking at? So that's actually a run in the interior wall. What do, does anyone know what I'm actually looking at? So is texture paint over what? It's actually over paneling. If you see the little nail pop down there, it's over paneling, that's why it ran. So it's actually texture paint over paneling. It's gonna pay about $4 a foot. Uh, so it's gonna pay really, really well. Here's my claim. So I pulled back the floor mat. This is the $2 million house. Do you see the buckle in the floor? Guess what? He didn't. It's a huge room. It's like 42 by 26. It's huge. That's also there. What is that? Water damage changes the color of the nails, causes that uh, oxidation in the nail. Good indication. That's actually three boards in off the patio door showing uh, buckling in the floor. That's a full replacement again. Laminate floor seam, real minor. Does everyone see that? Guess what? Everybody walks by this, doesn't write it. That's a full replacement of the floor. There's an easy one, right? Pretty big. That's a Levittown house. It's Willingboro, actually. Full replacement of the first floor. The laminate floor goes the entire first floor. Hardwood floor in front of a refrigerator. Does everybody see the damage there? There was first seven boards or so off the left edge. Full replacement, pre-finished floor, $15,000 claim. If you missed that one, go back to the other class in the other side over there, how to pull the handle on the slot machine. They're giving it right now. Does everyone see this one? That's hard to see, believe it or not. It's impact damage from the recent tornado we had in Ben Salem. So the impact damage broke the siding right under the window. That's Carolina beaded siding, $7, $700 a square. Missing piece of siding, but the big dollars on that isn't the missing piece of siding. There's actually a crack up top. What is that? What's the, what's the money on that shot? It's the asbestos. So the aluminum siding is easy, but the fact that it was installed over asbestos, you're gonna get the aluminum siding and the asbestos removal because it can't be put back over the asbestos. What am I looking at? I'm looking at right outside of a bathroom or laundry room and the floor is actually slightly buckled through that area. It is fully water damaged and it's a full replacement of a pre-finished floor, but the room that I left with the tile is the room causing the water to enter that hardwood floor. 
Do you see how bad that water damage is? That's actually kitchen cabinets, hardwood floor. The bathroom is in the back there behind that green wall. That's full hardwood. That's full cabinets, granite countertops. I mean, that could be $20,000. You walk in and people go, I didn't know that was a covered loss. Gas fireplace, it's always a loss. Just write it. Walk in. Gas fireplace should be the pearl. You have a gas fire. What I say about that is it's so simple to recognize. You spot the fireplace, do your smoke inspection. It's, so, it's like a 90% chance. There's shingles off of a roof. See them off there? It's kind of hard to tell sometimes. Can anyone spot that one? The image is pretty blown up. There's a tab off in the top. Pretty hard to see. That's actually Lori's claim. Tile impact claim. If you missed that one, that's another freebie. So the reason we use tile impact, it's not an exclusion under an HO3, even on a modified form. And cheers to 2022. That is the, it for my presentation. Did you guys learn something today?